Welcome to the Spondylitis Association of America's Spondylitis Educational Seminar. My name is Richard Howard, and it's my absolute honor to, and to welcome you and introduce the speakers today. I'm the Associate Executive Director at SAA, and I've been a paying member of the Spondylitis Association since my di AS diagnosis in 1989. I'm excited and grateful to be here. Over the years, I felt, and others have shared with me that I'm I always learn something new and important for managing spondyloarthritis at these seminars. And just as important, I meet inspirational people, people of all ages and challenges, people who have lived with pain every waking hour for 50 years, people that instead of a spine, they have one long bone, people that have um, nothing they can point to on an x-ray, but they still have all the pain of spondylitis. And I've met too many teenagers and parents of young children. But in the end, I'm grateful for all these encounters, grateful that they share their stories with me, grateful that they make this invisible disease more visible, and grateful that they're good listeners when I need to talk to someone, someone who gets it. So thank you, my spondylitis community. Uh, so welcome live stream uh, attendees. Uh, join the conversation on Twitter, hashtag SpondyStream. And people in the room can do that as well, just silence your cell phones. But, um, um, at the educational and support group leaders, I'm a leader in Los Angeles, at the educational and support group um, meeting and at these seminars, there's always, we always get some texts and calls and emails from people who registered but weren't physically well enough to join us in person. And perhaps some of you are joining us by live stream. Um, some, of you, some of you might be joining us on the archive, um, listening to it later. But please know that you're a vital part of this community as well and your, your Smilelice community, and we pray for a healthier tomorrow. Today's seminar is held during the American College of Rheumatology Co National Conference, and I want to thank all the medical professionals and researchers that devote their careers, some of them are in the room with us, uh, to spondylitis. Uh, in particular, I want to thank our speakers today, Dr. Weissman and Mr. Papa Christos. Uh, I want to thank Avi for your financial contributions to the seminar, and I want to thank the corporations and foundations also in the room today, some of them, um, that support SA's mission throughout the year. And in particular, I want to recognize our platinum member, Avi and UCB, and to Amgen, our silver corporate member. All right, so, um, and in fact, Avi and UCB have representatives here. At the Avi table is uh, Ramon and Marshall, and UCB is Jamie, and Tamarin, and you can talk to them, ask them questions during lunch and breaks. All right, so moving on, uh, I also I have to, I'm thrilled to thank um, the people in this room and our supporters. None of this would be possible without support of people affected by spondylitis. The majority of our programs come from individual donations. SA doesn't receive public or government funding. SA was founded by people living with spondylitis and it's the people living with spondylitis, spondylitis and their families and friends who continue to lead the quest to find a cure and to, and to improve the lives of others with spondylitis. So we have breaks built into the program, but as with all of our seminars and activities at Spondylitis Association, if you ever feel the need to stand up and stretch, you're always welcome to do that at any time. Um, and uh, so let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Weissman. Michael H. Weissman, um, MD is the Director of Division of Rheumatology at Cedar sinai Medical Center. Dr. Weissman's academic and research interests involve the generic risk, epidemiology, treatment and outcome of rheumatic diseases including clinical trials, outcomes research and health services research, and genetic accessibility severity studies with patients, of patients with chronic rheumata rheumatic diseases. He is currently the investigator for the National Institutes of Health Sponsored Studies in Systematic lupus, osteoarthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, vasculitis, and rheumatoid arthritis. He's board certified in internal medicine and rheumatology. Dr. Weissman has participated on agencies, review panels, and advisory boards for numbers of, numerous healthcare organizations, including the FDA Arthritis Advisory Committee, the Veterans Administration Cooperative Studies Program, the National Institute of Arthritis Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases, that's NIAMS, uh, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, Medical Board of California, American College of Rheumatology, Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Sciences, National Board of Medical Examiners, and the Spondylitis Association Scientific and Medical Advisory Board. 
He's published more than 400 peer-reviewed papers and five books. Um, he's recently edited the news, newest edition of Rheumatology and Major International Textbook on the Field of Rheumatic Diseases. In addition, he serves as reviewer for, and editor for many journals in the field of rheumatology, including the New England Journal of Medicine, Arthritis and Rheumatology, Journal of Rheumatology, Annals of Rheumatic Diseases, and Osteoarthritis and Cartilage. He was born in Los Angeles at Cedar sinai in Lebanon, which would later become Cedar sinai Medical Center. Dr. Weissman attended medical school at the University of Chicago and completed his internship, residency, and fellowship in rheumatology at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine. He is currently a holder of the Cedar sinai Chair in Rheumatology of, and Professor of Medicine at CSMC, a distinguished professor of medicine at the David Griffin School of Medicine at UCLA. So, we're honored and so pleased to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. i just trying to figure, how do I get the slides advanced? Do I say advance? Is that, there, there's, there's usually some super tech person here. Thank you. It was quite a flowery introduction. No, sir. No, it's not. Well, it, it was thinking of, I was thinking of the famous story about Frank Lloyd Wright. Remember the story about him? He was, he was testifying in a, uh, in a big lawsuit, and uh, he, uh, they didn't talk to him ahead of time. They didn't prep him, you know. So, so he goes up to the witness stand. They swear him in, and they say, "What's your name?" He says, "I'm." Frank Lloyd Wright, and I uh, said, well, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm the world's greatest architect. <laughs> so uh, apparently it didn't go very well, the testimony. And after the whole thing was over, they said to him, Mr. Wright, what, you know, how could you, how could you say that? You know, he says, I was under oath. <laughs> he says, I had to, uh, okay, so I had to tell the truth. <laughs> okay. Um, so we're going to talk about spondylitis and uh, a little bit, and it's going to be a little bit technical. You know, I'd rather be be a little bit more technical than than less. You know, I want to give you some uh, feeling for what it's like to be an investigator in the field of spinal arthritis and what some of the issues are that we deal with, and what I spend most of my time doing as an investigator in the field of spinal arthritis. So. Sort of selfishly, I'm going to sort of tell you a little bit about what I've been doing the last 10 or 15 years in this field. All right. So, if I can, we're going to talk about back pain first of all, and the problem of back pain in the United States, and how we have used this concept of back pain to get a window into how many people actually have spondylitis. Okay, and how many people have back pain and how many people have spondylitis with their back pain? That's a very important issue. How many people actually have the disease in the United States? And it's only recently that we've been able to determine how many people have the disease. Um, I'll talk a little bit about inflammatory back pain. That is the kind of back pain that distinguishes patients with spondylitis versus the back pain that I have. Okay which is different. My back pain is, gets worse as the day goes on, you know, and it's not relieved at all by medications, uh, or three operations. Okay, so that's a different kind of back pain than patients that have spondylitis, right? And we'll talk about the differences between the two. Uh, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the kind of patients that we're seeing today now that the definition of spondylitis has been broadened and it includes many, many more people that formerly were not recognized to have this disease, and that's extremely important. We're seeing now, for instance, as I'll show you in a minute, just as many women as men with this disease. When I was a little boy and learning about rheumatology, I was told it was 10 to 1. There were 10 men for every one woman with the disease. Now those numbers are almost equal because now we're recognizing the disease in its different form in women. Then we'll talk a little bit about the genetics of the disease and what causes it and the interesting role of exercise 
is exercise good or bad for patients with spondylitis? And then at the end, we'll talk about treatment and do our treatments currently make a difference in the disease? Okay, back pain. Now, this was an interesting study that was done uh, a couple of years ago where these investigators looked at insurance claims. These are patients that went to the doctor. Insurance claims of 100,000 patients with chronic low back pain and compared it to controls. 100,000 compared to 100,000 controls. And asked the question, how significant is back pain as a health care issue in the United States? Right? How significant is it? Well, it's terribly significant. The costs of back pain compared to a group of patients that are otherwise matched for age and gender and other disease characteristics match is two or three times greater than the control population. The use of opioids, for instance, is hugely increased in patients with chronic low back pain. Opioids, which do nothing for your back pain and do much more for the problem of addiction and dependency and all the issues involving the use of opiate drugs. Right? So back pain is a mega problem. And the health care costs of back pain are billions more than the health care costs of people without back pain. And interestingly, I looked carefully and found out how often are rheumatologists seeing patients with back pain? Remember, we're rheumatologists. And we're the ones recognizing spondylitis. Do we see patients with chronic back pain? No. In fact, this survey was done. I guess, this is, is there a pointer here? I guess, let's see. Whoops. If you look right here, the percentage of, peop, of, of healthcare workers that actually see young people with back pain is about equivalent to the number of psychiatrists that see patients with back pain. So we don't see these patients. They're seen mostly by primary care doctors, orthopedic surgeons, and chiropractors, okay? People that are very difficult to educate, right? And so you can see if you compare the, the, the percentage of these patients, young versus old, that are seen by these specialists, you see that primary care providers and orthopedic surgeons are the ones that actually see patients with low back pain. So it's a real challenge to find patients with spondylitis in this world of low back pain. Now, what about treatments of low back pain and, and, and practice patterns? This was a telephone survey of households, telephone, random telephone survey of households asking questions about low back pain and asking what these patients are actually doing. It turns out that Even if you haven't seen a doctor in a year, you're taking narcotics. Now, how do these people get narcotics if they're not seeing a doctor? They're getting them from their spouse or their friends. You know? I mean, it's a real disaster. And what kind of tests are done for these people? X-rays, X-rays, MRIs, X-rays, all this kind of stuff. The amount of radiation and the amount of imaging exposure in patients with chronic back pain is huge, and it's often useless to make a diagnosis. So the whole problem of back pain is very large. It's unaddressed, and especially unaddressed by those of us interested in finding patients with spondylitis. So, so the take-home message about back pain is that it's extremely common. Both under-treatment and over-treatment are very common. There's a huge abuse of diagnostic tests, especially imaging. There is data that exercise, for instance, does help people with chronic low back pain. It certainly helped me, all right? But nobody uses it. They use things like TENS units, you know, and all these kinds of things where there is absolutely no rigorous proof that any of these things have any effect on people with chronic low back pain. Very few rheumatologists see these patients. So the bottom line here is how do we as rheumatologists and how, does you, how do you as volunteers to help us rheumatologists diagnose and find patients with ankylosing spondylitis in this sea of uncertainty?
So how many people have spinal arthritis or ankylosing spondylitis in the United States? First of all, you have to define the terms. This was an old concept, an old concept that <clears throat> patients with these diseases were fairly discreet. They had separate clinical entities. There was ankylosing spondylitis in the middle. There was psoriatic arthritis over here acute anterior uveitis over here, reactive arthritis, arthritis associated with Crohn's disease or inflammatory bowel disease, and juvenile onset disease. We were taught that these were discrete entities. That's absolutely false. These conditions actually overlap. They overlap tremendously and they evolve from one into another. They're mixed in terms of clinical features, genetics, and treatment outcome. So today, we're defining the disease differently. We're calling the concept spondyloarthritis, refers to the whole group. Those that have predominantly axial or spine disease and some peripheral joints are those that have predominantly peripheral arthritis, hands, feet, knees, and so forth. Okay, so it's a matter of predominant because we do know now that the genetics of these conditions overlap and the patients actually overlap over time. So these conditions were not fixed in time. They evolved from one to another. So terminology today, we talk about axial versus peripheral spondyloarthritis, all right? As opposed to these old fashioned names that we used to use. So how many people have the disease? Many years ago, 20 plus years ago, a survey was done, a survey in the population. And what they used for the survey <clears throat> were x-rays, x-rays of people's pelvis to look for ankylosing spondylitis, x-rays. Now we all know that it takes years before you actually get an x-ray change and you can have the disease for many years before there is any x-ray change. So this is going to be an underestimate of the number of people with spinal arthritis. So using x-rays alone, using x-rays alone, it was estimated that 0.21% of the population has ankylosing spondylitis, just using x-rays. This study was very influential. What it did is it told the world and specifically the world of funders, that is the National Institutes of Health and pharmaceutical companies, that this was a rare condition. It wasn't all that common. And those are the people that make policy decisions about where the money goes for research and education. So the money all went to rheumatoid arthritis, all right, which was felt to be twice as prevalent. It turns out, in truth, they're actually reverse, and we'll get to that in a second. So this was a powerfully influential but incorrect study. The National Health and Nutrition Study, which I'm going to talk about in a second in a little bit more detail, is a very interesting study. Are you familiar with the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey? Okay. What it is, is that your tax dollars every year support a phalanx of giant tractor trailers full of healthcare professionals going out into the community to examine normal people to see the prevalence of real disease. This is extremely important. And it's a sampling issue because they can't sample everybody. So they use the census data to know where to go to sample certain groups. Some groups are oversampled, some groups are undersampled, to see how many people have diseases like diabetes and high blood pressure and heart disease and the like. Why is this important? Why are you paying for this? It's because the prevalence of diseases determine public policy about where money is spent, which in turn helps us understand these diseases. So the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey is extremely important. When this was done 30, 40 years ago, they took x-rays of people. Normal people got x-rays in this van. 
can't do that today. You know, it's not legal to do that today. It's not acceptable to x-ray normals, right? But they did this before there was such things as human subjects committees and IRBs, institutional review boards. This was done in the good old days when we didn't have to ask permission uh, to do dangerous things to patients. So at this time, they took x-rays of normals. I'd be out of my mind if I put in a protocol to my institution and say, I'm going to get a bunch of normals and take x-rays. You know, that was, of course, they'd ask me about, you know, um, how I was going to address it with the patient and you know, all this kind of stuff. They wouldn't be thinking that I was doing something wrong. But this was really doing something before there were these rules. And when they x-rayed patients, they found that the actual prevalence in the normal population of sacroiliitis, x-ray evidence, was twice as much as they found in the first survey, 0.52%. So now it's building up, actually. We're finding out that there are more and more people now. In this case, it was just x-ray evidence alone. So the other way to find out how many people have spondyl arthritis is very interesting. Since we know that 80 to 90 percent of people with spondylitis have the gene HLA-B27, we know that, don't we? We already know that. We've known that for 40 years. So why not go out and just look at the prevalence of HLA-B27? That's easy to do. You draw some blood, do a test. So if you do that, you, can, you find out something very interesting that the prevalence of HLA-B27 varies tremendously all over the world. And it has a north-south gradient. All right, you see that? And there are some countries where the indigenous population, the native population, has no B27. Now, remember, this is just the indigenous population. For example, I mean, it's, it's not true that no one in Australia has B27. It's that the native population does not have B27. But that's not all the people that live in these areas, right? We know that populations shift and move and change and things happen and there are wars and famines and migrations and all this kind of stuff, so people move. So the United States is a gamish. The USA is a gamish of, do we know what the word gamish is? <laughs> it's a hodgepodge of those of us who live in Los Angeles, we use the word gamish. Up here you say hodgepodge. So of different ethnic groups, each of which has a different prevalence of HLA B27. And of course, people mix it up, right, in the United States. They don't all stay their same ethnic group. So over time, there's only going to be one ethnic group, as far as I can tell, if we wait long enough. But there are, but there are different ethnic populations, even within the United States. So you can't use B27 alone to know how many people have spondylitis. But you can guess, you can guess. Where there's a high prevalence of B27, such as in the Netherlands, okay, it pretty much matches the prevalence of spondylitis. There is a group way up in Alaska, a Native American group called the Haida Indians. They came over the Bering Strait 30,000 years ago, then they stayed up there and they intermarried. You know, they're all the same up there. And they have a prevalence of B27 of 50%, 50%, and 6% of the population has a spondyl arthritis condition, right? It's quite amazing, isn't it? So B27 is good. It's not necessarily sufficient, but it's largely necessary to make the diagnosis. And so you can't use that. So how do we really find out how many people have spondylitis? Well, we use a screening test. The screening test is, do you have inflammatory back pain or not? I hate to give credit to people from Stanford, uh, but that's where these guys were from. I'm a Berkeley guy, so you know, you know we can't deal with people from Stanford. But these guys at Stanford in the early 1970s asked the question, 
Is there a better test for ankylosing spondylitis than B27? So they made up a series of questions. They just made them up. They just didn't make them up. They, they, they were clinicians and they knew the kinds of things that spondylitis patients had. And so they did a, a study. They rounded up 40 or 50 bona fide spondylitis patients. They rounded up 40 or 50 chronic low back, patient, low back pain patients who are B27 negative from an orthopedic clinic. And they rounded up a bunch of normals. And they asked the questions in the following manner. If you look at questions number four, how long have you had this back pain? Look at number eight. Is it associated with morning stiffness? All right, worse in the morning. Number 12, when did you first have back pain? How old were you? Number 14 here, did the problem begin suddenly like somebody had a disc or did it begin slowly or insidiously over time? And number 16, what, what does exercise or activity do? Does it make it worse or make it better as the day goes on? So they asked these questions to these three groups, and interestingly enough, they, these questions discriminated clearly among AS patients versus the chronic low back pain patients. Clearly they discriminated against it, and it turns out that young age, insidious onset, lasting longer than three months, associated with stiffness in the morning and improvement with physical activity, those issues clearly separated out patients with spondylitis versus chronic low back pain controls. And this is the origin of inflammatory back pain. We use these questions today. On a regular basis, I see patients come to see me. Day after day, do I have spondylitis? And I ask these same questions to separate the patient out. It's not perfect. You know, I use B27, I use MRI, I use intuition, I use whether their brother has spondylitis. I'm gonna use a lot of other things, but this is a very important difference. And it's a very important difference from an epidemiologic standpoint, we'll get to in a second. So all over the world then, people have adopted these criteria. Everybody wants to be different, right? So there, you've got the original criteria here that I just mentioned, those four or five things. And then you've got these, the French, they always have to be different. You've got the Germans and you've got the Dutch. They're exactly the same, exactly the same, but they all want their own, okay? They all have to have their own, right? But there's no difference among these three. So this is the concept of inflammatory back pain. So here's N. Haynes going out in the community, armed with these questions three years ago. Okay, armed with these questions and examined normals. We couldn't do x-rays, we could do B27 testing, and we had these inflammatory back pain questions. So we said, okay, we've got these things, let's go out again, we can't take x-rays, to the normals, and let's determine how many people in the United States have inflammatory back pain, and then we're gonna ask a whole bunch of other questions to them. We're gonna ask them if they have had iritis, whether they have psoriasis, whether they had a family member with spondyloarthritis. We're gonna ask a whole bunch of other questions about whether they actually have the disease spondyloarthritis. Right. So we're gonna do two things. We're gonna have, we're gonna get the prevalence of inflammatory back pain in the population, and we're gonna get the prevalence of ankylosing spondylitis or spondyloarthritis. So your money, your money, went into this research, right? It turns out, if you just ask people if they have back pain, 20% of the population says yes, right? That's just any back pain. 20%, one out of five. And it doesn't vary by age. Young versus old, there's no difference. Very interesting, right? But if you ask the inflammatory back pain questions that I just mentioned, the it's about five, between five and 6% of the population has inflammatory back pain. Now, that doesn't mean they all have spondylitis, okay? What it means is it's a screening tool. It's a screening tool. It's very sensitive, 
okay, but not terribly specific. So then you ask other questions, more specific for spondylitis, okay, and you come up with a prevalence of anywhere between 0.9 and 1.4 percent of the USA population has a form of spondyl arthritis. So scientifically, today, we have proven that this disease, spondyl arthritis, is more prevalent than rheumatoid arthritis today. Rheumatoid arthritis prevalence is what? 0.6 percent of the population has rheumatoid arthritis. It's actually gone down. Do you know that? The prevalence of rheumatoid arthritis has actually gone down over the years. Does anybody want to venture a guess why? Meds? Hmm? Medicine? No, it has nothing to do with medicine. Well, what's, if we think of our diseases as genetic predisposition and environmental triggers, okay, what's the biggest trigger that's been known for rheumatoid arthritis over the years? Smoking, exactly. Cigarette smoking. And you can trace the decline in the prevalence of rheumatoid arthritis worldwide, and it matches the decline in cigarette smoking. So today, rheumatoid arthritis has become a much less common disease because smoking is much less common today, cigarette smoking. Cigarette smoking is by a, also a, a trigger for ankylosing spondylitis as well, but not nearly as strong as it is for rheumatoid arthritis. And rheumatoid arthritis researchers feel that it's the lung, which is the portal of entry for cigarette smoking, that is the area where the disease actually begins. And there may be a relationship to air pollution and other things that come in through the lung that also trigger rheumatoid arthritis. But that's enough, talk, that's enough for another talk. That's the RA talk, you can come back to that later. This is a spondylitis talk. All right. So getting back to the real point here is that the prevalence of your disease is either 1% or slightly greater now in the United States. And that's why, that's why the pharmaceutical companies have suddenly become much more interested in this area, appropriately so, I guess because we have patients that we can treat now with drugs. So that's the take home message of this part of the talk. So what are, who are the current patients today that we're seeing with spinal arthritis? Who are they? What's, what's my life like? What's my world like here, all right? What do I do? Well, I wanna introduce you to the concept of enthesitis Enthesitis, the emphasis, is the connection between ligaments, tendons, and bone. It's a special little thing. It's the biggest emphasis in your body is the Achilles tendon in the back of your heel, but they're all over the place, around the elbow, the knees, and internally, because of the ligaments internally, everything connects to one another. So what's important about it? Well, what's important about it is that our disease, spondylitis, tends to manifest itself by inflammation at these entheses. Not just frank arthritis of a joint, which it does, but also areas and tissues and structures around the joint at these entheses. And so the nickname is enthesitis, just like Arthritis means inflammation at the entheses. And the enthesis is a very complex structure. It has um, different types of cartilage, it has a membrane, it has blood vessels, and it has a special set of inflammatory cells that have been discovered that reside in these entheses in certain animal experiments. And these special cells, these, they're very special because they have certain markers on them, are very important because they may in fact be the cell that when acted upon by an outside trigger 
produces change throughout the rest of the body. Okay, that's very important. So why do people get iritis? Right? Why do people get heart disease or aortitis or lung disease sometimes with spondylitis? Well, that's been a big mystery. Well, now we begin to think now maybe we can come up with some theories about why this actually takes place. That there may be a set of cells that reside in this area when acted upon in a certain way will go out into the periphery and affect other organs and tissues throughout the body. This is extremely important because it gives us a focus where we can narrow down our research to look for the triggers for these individual areas and hopefully eliminate them. Right? So we'll get to that just in a minute. So I'm going to use this concept of anthocytis. So features that in my day, God, it was a long time ago, um, that we thought were atypical. You know, there was a typical patient with spondylitis. It was a man who got the disease in his mid-20s. Nothing much could be done about it. It produced inexorably bone fusion and all the kinds of changes, and then there were the complications, et cetera, et cetera. Well, today, it's quite different. These are the patients that I see in my office today. First of all, half of them are women, right? Um, some of the women are actually of older age onset than, than, than the men. We don't really understand the reason for that, but it's true. The onset of the disease is later in a woman. Don't really quite understand the reason. Many patients are B27 negative. B27 is not the only answer to the disease. There are other genes associated with spondylitis, right? We are identifying them now, and not necessarily HLA B27. Many of these patients don't present with back pain. They actually present with swollen feet and painful joints, peripheral joints, right? Maybe many of you realize that uh, because of yourselves. Back pain is not necessarily present. And what we're seeing is actually many of these patients, especially women, are having some adverse reactions to the anti-TNF drugs more commonly than the men. Adverse reactions are not common anyway, but the women seem to have a little bit greater prevalence of these adverse reactions, and we don't understand the reasons why. We hopefully, we will understand. And of course, the importance of advanced imaging. MRI has been the most amazing tool in our shed to be able to diagnose patients. Because remember, the spine is quite hidden from view. You know, you can't touch it or feel it and examine it or biopsy it like we did with rheumatoid arthritis. So we need some way of looking for inflammation. And the MRI has been just unbelievable in being able to make these diagnoses. But the MRI is not perfect. We'll talk about that. So what causes the disease? What is the what are the manifestations of it, and what, what do we know at this point? Well, I'm not a basic scientist, so I have to excuse a little bit that I'm going to summarize data, and don't ask me any questions about this part. Okay. This Judy Smith, who is a wonderful pediatric rheumatologist from Wisconsin, she gave me this slide to use, and this is she put this together. She, her view of spondylitis is that you've got two major factors. One is the environment, which we don't quite understand, but we do know that it's bugs in the environment or perhaps even physical force in the environment that could trigger the disease. Added to genetics produces some very interesting biology, and that's what I was talking about, these cells, these little T cells in the anthesis. And that interesting biology then produces the clinical disease. So we never would have been able to do this 10 years ago. We didn't know anything about this 10 years ago. So here's, the, here's what I was just describing earlier. There's a certain set of cells that reside in this anthesis right here, this T cell here. This special T cell has a receptor on it here that reacts to a cytokine that comes from this black box here, the black box of the trigger for the disease. Right? 
So IL-23 reacts to the IL-23 receptor. It triggers this T cell to exude two other cytokines, IL-22 and IL-17. And these are, the, these are the cytokines that go out and produce the new bone and the pain of the disease. So we have drugs now, okay, that actually can interrupt these pathways. Some of those drugs are out there and some of the drugs are in, dr are in development right now. So these are now the new targets for the disease. We already know about TNF, we target that. But now there are drugs out there that target, they're gonna target IL-17 and IL-23. IL-17 over here and IL-23 over here. So that's, the, that this biology then has given us new tools and the, and the companies are after these, after these cytokines to knock them down and perhaps treat the patients more effectively. So that's, that's really where, where the biology is all about now. And five years from now, this will all be different, but this is the way it is right now. And this data comes from animal experiments, not human experiments. This is all from animal experiments now, and we're trying to apply it to the human situation. So what are the triggers? Are they bugs or are they physical force? Well, actually, there's data for both in the disease. There's data that supports microorganisms in the gut, and there's data that supports physical force, pounding, stress, impact loading, that may in fact produce these abnormalities. Right? And I'll go over that data quickly for you, okay? We've known for a long time that if you are HLA B27 positive, and regrettably, you get a infection in your gut with a bad organism like Salmonella or Shigella, you know, those organisms. Those are bad organisms. They're not normally there. there was a, they're the ones that contaminated food. They're ones that we were advised not to go to eat the street vendors, food in Tijuana. You know, this is, you don't want these things, right? They trigger a form of reactive arthritis and if you're B27 positive, that reactive arthritis will turn into chronic ankylosing spondylitis. So all you need is one shot of these bad organisms, and if you have the right genetic makeup, you will have a disease forever. That we've known about for a long, long time. Now, not all patients with spondylitis have had one of these kind of infections, right? So are there other organisms in the gut, say, that reside there normally, or not normally, that you don't get by eating bad food, but for some reason you have, right, that trigger the disease in the majority of people? Well, that's the current research area. That's the microbiome research that's going on now, looking at patients with and without the disease and patients over time and first degree relatives at their microbiome, the structure and function of organisms in the gut that may predispose toward spondylitis. So that's the current research that's going on, that area. We also know that if you make an animal model of spondylitis by taking B27 gene and putting it into a rat, human HLA B27 gene and put it into a rat, and then manipulating the environment. It turns out that if this HLA B27 positive rat lives in a germ-free environment, the rat doesn't get the disease. But if you put a, that rat in a normal cage in a regular environment, the rat gets the disease. So it's the relationship between the gene and the organism. And much research is going on now as to how that happens. Why does B27 predispose toward some connection with an organism in the gut? What is it? Okay, and people talk about misfolding of B27. B27 doesn't handle these peptides properly in the gut, and on and on and on and on, that there's, th this, this is an area of interesting research, and presumably in the next few years, we'll learn more about it. So both human experiments 
the human experiment is people that got these well there have been some experiments they weren't intended there was an experiment that was done in the 1960s it was a US Navy ship that docked for liberty in a port in North Africa anybody heard of this story okay and uh, the the uh, sailors were told not to go into the town because they're you could get some contaminated food or whatever You're supposed to stay close to the ship well there were some people that didn't obey the rules and one of the persons that didn't obey the rules was the cook <laughs> so the cook on the ship went into the town and got sick with salmonella or shigella ate something and came back to the ship and then at the ship left he made all the food for everybody and he was sick with salmonella and shigella and he had to work like crazy to make the food so he didn't wash his hands I mean all this story and the whole ship got sick okay and as the doctor wrote they were out about a week and the doctor wrote in the report we knew there was a problem he said it's the doctor on board the ship who wrote up this case it turns out that patients got arthritis reactive arthritis following this bout of bacillary dysentery as they were confined in the ship and the exact prevalence of the num of the ship's men that got arthritis was the exact frequency of HLA-B27 in the population. Okay? Right. And then later on, years later, the researchers at Stanford were able to get a hold of the medical records and find these individuals through the military record system and bring them back in and examine them. And they found four out of seven of these people that were afflicted with arthritis, they all had spondylitis. All right? So this was an unwanted experiment, just like with the rats. You throw people in, give them this stuff, and only those with B27 got, everybody got dysentery, but only the B27 people got spondylitis. All right? So this is, was written up a couple of years ago. Anyway. Now what about mechanical stress? What about physical force? Is that a factor? Well, it turns out that this paper was so interesting. They didn't have any diagrams, so I just put the title of the paper. What they did is they took a mouse and they upregulated TNF in this mouse and the mouse develops arthritis right? but what they did is that they lifted the tail of the mouse up so only the front paws were taking force and the back paws didn't and it was only in the front paws that they developed arthritis you know in this in this mouse and the arthritis, histology of the arthritis looked just like spondylitis. And the back paws, although they had inflammation, just as much inflammation from the TNF, they didn't develop the arthritis. So it was the physical contact of this force in the setting, in this animal model, that produced arthritis. And this, and this has been done now in another set of experiments, so that, so that there's something special about physical activity. So what did we do about this? So Michael Ward uh, was able to get a hold of a database of people with occupational activities. And what he showed in, was that if you looked at patients with ankylosing spondylitis, hundreds of them in our cohort, Bending, stretching, twisting, and vibration exposure were associated with more x-ray damage 
in our cohort than otherwise equally matched patients who didn't have those occupations. So it was the occupations that involved physical pounding and impact loading that was associated with worse x-ray change in the group of patients with spondylitis. So there's something bad about that kind of exercise. I'll, I'll skip this, this area. So it's both microbes and physical force that are on our plate now to examine as the possible triggers for this disease. All right, so we've taken you full circle through this whole disease. Now let's talk about, if you have the disease, what about treatment? What's, what is treatment like for spondylitis? Do anti-inflammatory drugs have an impact on ankylosing spondylitis? How many people in this room take regular NSAIDs? Okay, God, it's about a third at least, right? These are drugs like Celebrex and, and uh, uh, Motrin, uh, Diclofenac, you know, the whole list of them, okay? Do they have, do they make, other than make you feel better, do they actually change the radiographic outcome of the disease? How many people think yes? How many people think no? You're wrong. There have been several interesting studies that have shown that if you continuously take these drugs over time, slowly, they actually show that they will reduce the rate of new bone formation, right? It's almost imperceptible, but it does actually happen. And the interesting thing is we've known about this for a long time. We've actually known about this and we, we didn't pay attention to it. The orthopedic surgeons have been telling us for years that postoperatively, they do not have their patients take anti-inflammatory drugs because they're worried Okay, they're worried that these anti-inflammatory drugs will actually suppress healing. Okay, actually suppress healing. And what is healing is, you know, that's callus and new bone, right? So they don't want you, they don't want you to take these drugs because you're suppressing healing. And they have all kinds of experiments to show this. Well, it turns out that they're right. It turns out that if you take these drugs for long periods of time, they actually suppress new bone formation. Not nearly as much as the TNF drugs will over time, but they actually do. So the data is interesting. So anti-inflammatory drugs do more than just relieve pain. But to do anti-TNF drugs really change the bone progression of the disease? Do they, do they really do that? Okay. Well, we didn't know about this until very recently. And the reason we didn't know about this until recently is that our ability to evaluate bone change in spondylitis is hampered by the fact that it's such a slow-moving disease and that it takes years and years of observations to be able to tell the difference between those people that take a drug and those people that don't. It's a long period of time. It's unlike rheumatoid arthritis where things happen very fast, very quickly. You can show that drugs that treat rheumatoid arthritis within three to six months will actually have an impact on the changes in the bone. But in spondylitis, it's such a slow process that it takes almost between three to four years of observations of comparing one cohort to another to be able to see the difference between those patients that take an anti-TNF drug and those patients that don't. Well, how did this come about? Well, all of the drugs today that are approved for biologic drugs that are approved for spondylitis, they all have a tremendously good impact on the disease clinically, but they've not been shown in these studies to have an impact on the x-ray changes. But these x-ray changes were only done over two years over a two year period. Two years is not enough. So we did our cohort and we asked the question, some other questions is, it seemed as if some very strange things happened. It seems as if many times, if you take a TNF drug and you stop it, it looks like the bone got worse 
Well, what does that mean? It's paradoxical effect. And we also saw that you suppress inflammation with the anti-TNF drugs, and you still got bone changes. And so is inflammation not linked? Is control of inflammation not linked to bone changes? And if we suppress inflammation, what impact does it have on the bone changes? Does it make it worse or does it make it better? So it's very screwed up and crazy in our world, and it only took until recently our ability to answer the question. So the disease, if we look at, if we look at the relationship between inflammation and bone formation in this disease, right, it's as if inflammation here is discontinuous, not continuous in spondylitis. That's one of the interesting facts of the disease. It's discontinuous, all right? It doesn't occur in a regular basis every single day in the same way, right? So if we, if we examine, let's see if I can get my, well, this, this slide is supposed to have a, uh, a, uh, an arrow that comes up here and an arrow that comes down there. It didn't work very well. What you need to do is that if you measure inflammation here, high, and you see there's little bone here, then you measure inflammation here, less but still elevated, there's more bone here. Well, what does that mean? What that means is that it takes... Did I do this? <laughs> Am I saved by the bell? I'll explain it better than that. Inflammation in spondylitis is discontinuous. It comes in fits and starts. And every time you have inflammation, it produces secondarily some new bone formation. Right? OK, let's see if I can do this again. Let's get this slide out of here. <laughs> Just go to the next one. I, this isn't working, so that's why I'm. My trigger isn't working for some reason. There were other slides. I hate to. Oh. Go more. Yeah. Okay. So if you make these measurements here, it looks like it, it looks like there's no relationship between inflammation and bone formation. Control inflammation, bone formation goes up. It's because of the time lag. But if you control inflammation and get rid of all these bumps, eventually this will happen, okay? It'll stop. It'll stop going up, right? So the problem is we didn't wait long enough when we examined our patients. So we decided to wait long enough, and we did this study, which was published a year and a half ago. And what we, we, we had four, three to 400 sets of x-rays on patients with spondylitis going out over six or eight years, okay? So we were able to extend that window to look and see what happened. And so we compared patients that had TNF drugs and versus the ones that did not take TNF drugs. And we matched them, we matched them for the amount of inflammation they have at the beginning, right? And what we showed is several things. First of all, cigarette smoking impacts x-ray progression you can see in this. And the more you smoke, okay, the more x-ray progression you get. Cigarette smoking biologically is bad for spondylitis, right? But if we institute anti-TNF drugs early, this line here is the amount of people that get x-ray progression here. If we institute anti-TNF drugs early, Okay, you delay, you delay the onset of x-ray progression of the disease. So anti-TNF drugs actually delay and reduce over the long term x-ray progression. And interestingly, you can, it takes two, over two years of follow-up to show that there was a difference between those patients that took anti-TNF drugs and those patients that didn't take them. So the drug company studies didn't wait long enough to be able to show there was an impact. 
So our observational cohort studies, when we examined x-rays that went out greater than two years, we were able to show that there was an impact of anti-TNF drugs. It's just that the slow-moving disease in our assay system wasn't good enough to be able to make this determination within the first two years of the disease. So if you use biologic drugs, what's the risk? All right, what's the risk? Do these drugs cause infection or cancer? What's the answer to that question? Yes and no. How can you have an answer yes and no? That's the way it's far, isn't it? Well, the answer is both yes and no. All right? We're only going to talk about rheumatoid arthritis now. We're going to shift gears because we have the most experience with rheumatoid arthritis. And I'm going to show you data. I'm going to show you some data. A meta-analysis was done almost 10 years ago. And a meta, you know what a meta-analysis is? You take other people's data and mix it together. <laughs> That's the simplest way of looking. Many small clinical trials are too small to show differences. So to do a meta-analysis, you take all these small clinical trials and add them up together to give you statistical power to show a difference between a drug and no drug, right? So if you do a meta-analysis of clinical trials of biologic drugs, anti-TNF drugs, in rheumatoid arthritis, you are able to show a very, very slight increase in infection risk here and malignancy risk here. This is the summary slide here. This was very controversial when this was published because other studies showed that there was no risk those were observational cohort studies done of thousands of patients in the real world. So the observational cohort studies, where you look at people that take the drug in the community and compare them to the ones that don't, and you match them as best as you can for disease activity and severity, you can't show a difference between people that take a biologic drug and the people that don't. You can't sh cannot show a difference. It looks the same. But if you do a meta-analysis of these controlled clinical trials, you do show a slight difference. So how do we square this? How do we square these two findings? One says yes, and one says no. Are they both right or both wrong? They're both right. They're both right. So one way to do that is to do a mega meta-analysis, a mega, mega, mega meta-analysis. This was just published a month or two ago. This was a super duper mega analysis. This is 10 years more of data than the original one, right? And what did they show? They showed the exact same thing, exact same thing. These are hundreds and hundreds of patients in these clinical trials. And you can see way up here at the top, yeah, Trying to point right here. You see this little blip here? Okay. That shows there was a slight increased risk of infections in rheumatoid arthritis patients who took biologics compared to the ones that didn't. The more a higher dose you took, the sicker the patients showed a difference. If the biologics were low dose, it showed no difference. This is, is these are hundreds and hundreds of patients showed the exact same thing as the original meta-analysis. So how do you square this with the observational data? Well, let me explain it to you. If you, the two other factors that promote infection risk are, number one, disease activity. If you have worse disease activity, you have more risk for inf infection. And if you take corticosteroids independently, you have a greater risk for an infection, right? But if you take a biologic drug and suppress disease activity and suppress and get rid of the steroids because patients feel better, okay, those risks go down and those risks outweigh the risk, the slight increased risk of the biologic drug. So therefore, it's a wash. 
you understand what I mean by this? So that's why the observational cohort studies show no difference. The clinical trial meta-analyses show a difference. So if you look at all the risks, the greater the amount of steroids you have and the additional risk factors magnify the risk for infection. But if you suppress those, those risks go away. So this is what it looks like. TNF slightly increases your risk for infection by itself, but TNF impact on the disease activity and, and its impact getting rid of steroids right, tips the scale the other way, so it's a wash. So there you have it. So the answer to your question, somebody says to me, patient says to me, do, if I take this drug, will I get more infection? And I say, yes and no. <laughs> you know, right? On the other hand, you know, on the one hand, on the other hand. Now you understand what I mean. So to answer your question, am I taking a risk? Yeah, there is a slight risk, but in the overall scheme of things, that risk is actually reduced when your disease gets better. So looking at spinal arthritis today, we're diagnosing as many women as men. 1% of the population has spinal arthritis. Okay. The MRI is very important. We use it on a regular basis to help us make a diagnosis. But there are some false positives and negatives. We, we are trying to understand the relative risk of triggering the disease by physical force versus organisms in the GI tract. Anti-TNF drugs do prevent damage, and I can comfortably say that to patients that ask me that question. You know, am I really doing something? Not just relieving pain or taking a pain pill, am I doing something to the actual disease? I can comfortably say yes. And finally, in the future, is this IL-23 cytokine going to be the key to treatment of the disease and to understand the disease? Remember, that came out of those interesting biology that I presented to you. So that's kind of what I have to say here this morning. I've taken a tour of the disease from epidemiology, clinical, down to animal models, okay, pathogenesis, and now treatment. And I hope that I made some sense to all of you. Thank you. So we'll do a question and answers. There's two mics set up. There's a mic there and back there. And if you, if you can make it to the mic, great. Otherwise, we'll bring a mic to you. OK. Be kind. <laughs> Don't ask questions about yourself here, please. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. OK, that's yeah. the other thing. As I, we love all of you, but I've been doing this for so long, I just want to make sure that you understand if other people in the audience kind of get upset if somebody comes up and talks about their own situation and dominates the conversation. Ask your questions that have some general impact, OK? Thank you very much. That was a great talk. Is this on? Doesn't sound like it. Coming. It is on. No, it's me that's on. Huh? This one. This one's on. No. Should I just, should I just go first? Thank you very much. That was um, an excellent presentation. I appreciate it. I'm a physician, um, and I have a few questions actually. The first one is: Has anybody started looking at tick-borne infections and their relationship to triggering arthritis, and in particular, AS. Um, so in Lyme disease and Borrelia. Um, so that's one question. I also Let's wondered answer that. Uh, okay. As far as I know, it, that's not been an area of research, tick-borne diseases. Yeah. The, um, interestingly, I didn't mention this earlier, that Patients that are B27 positive do have a greater susceptibility to certain kinds of enteric infections. They last longer. 
They also, if you're B27 positive, you have a greater, uh, um, well, not say greater, you have a less risk of severe viral infections. Interestingly, so B27 positive people that get HIV or hepatitis virus, they actually have a milder course. It actually protects you from viral infections. Mm -hmm. So, and so, you know, so it's, it's a complicated mm -hmm. situation. It's not just all infections that yeah. do this. In fact, you're protected if you're B27 positive from certain viral infections. Mm -hmm. Because I, I am concerned that some bacteria does seem to uh, last and stay and become chronic. So I am finding in some of my patients that they continue to carry, for example, Borrelia burgdorferi that for long know. periods of time, and that treating with the antibiotics actually reverses the pain from the arthritis. And they are using in rheumatology yeah. things like doxycycline now, and yet they don't want to talk about it being related to any sort of infectious. They're just saying, oh, doxycycline has an anti-inflammatory effect. Well, it turns out that in some of these epidemics where B27 positive people get Campylobacter or uh, other enteric organisms, if you treat early yeah. with antibiotics, you can prevent long term. But once it sets in motion, mm -hmm. the antibiotic the immune, treatment does. The immune reaction, yeah. Yeah, the mm -hmm. antibiotics. Yeah. Don't touch it. So. Well, it, and, and then I, I just wondered about the uh, markers for on the imaging. So are we really sure that the increased in bone formation, does that correlate with symptoms? Because as in the heart, the ar arteries in the heart, they're really looking at calcification now as a healing process. And for example, that plaque is more stable. Well, the MRI itself shows several different things. You can actually show inflammation and healing mm -hmm. in the MRI. And so there is a correlation between inflammation and symptoms, mm -hmm. okay, in, in these patients. That has been shown, which is right. very interesting. But not the calcification, necessarily. Well, that's the, the, the ossification, the bone formation takes place very much way down the line. Mm -hmm. Very but much the, and that could be a marker for healing Excuse me process. for just one moment, Dr. Weisman. Yeah. Uh, we are at 11.45. I know you had to leave 11.55. And if I may ask that um, people keep questions to one a person because we are extremely short on time right now. We, bet, we went a little bit over. One quick question. Come on, who's next? On that side. The there you go. Hi. I've had uh, success in controlling AS through killing bad bacteria in my gut and then going on elimination diet and finding that for me gluten was the trigger that, that caused that. I'm just curious if there's any discussion about changes in the, in the protocol uh, to try to you know, focus on, on diet as also as an optional step in You're the treatment. You're absolutely right. We're, we're now talking to our colleagues in the world of inflammatory bowel disease and looking if we can put into play certain diets to change the microbiome and see what impact that's going to have on spondylitis. That's a hot area, and we're embarking upon some interesting studies right now to do that. That's it's an amazing area uh, to do that. And we found one of our colleagues is a physician who works for Whole Foods, and so we're going to try and collaborate with them <laughs> on a project. Wouldn't that be interesting? All right, great, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, have there been any studies of the effects of long-term running, which many people like me started at a young age to alleviate the potential for heart disease, and if you run for 20 or 25 years on pavement, I'm wondering if there's been any research and that relationship to AS? Um, this is a very controversial area. I can imagine. So I have a patient who's a uh, college rower, you know, and they sit on these these uh, things on a hard surface, and they put their legs on there, and they pull really hard. I mean, what could be worse if you think that physical force has something to do with the spine and with the sacroiliac joints? My God, uh, I told him to uh, keep on rowing. <laughs> Because he wants to be a national champion or something. I mean, this is still in its infancy to try and figure out whether or not certain types of physical force and impact loading make a difference, you know? 
This is just data that we're accumulating now. We don't have an answer about what the right thing to do is. So keep on jogging. Well, know. actually, I had to stop. I mean, the pain, I couldn't run after 20, 21 years of running, so I actually had to stop running. And then I was shortly thereafter diagnosed with AS. But okay, it's a question. Question. Yeah, um, I have AS, and I'm also a physical therapist. So one of the things I found interesting, the slide you put up on the uh, T, T4 cells and the, um, the stromal cells, and, and, and I was wondering if um, capsulitis, is, capsulitis, whether it's traumatic or idiopathic, or do they have, are you seeing that as having more systemic effects too? This, this data is all from animal models. There's no human data now to support the location of these areas and the amelioration of the effect. You know, so your question's a really good one. What about other areas like capsulitis and other areas of inflammation in areas around the joint? We, we really don't understand that at all. You know, this is just very provocative and it's animal data. So you kind of already touched on this question, but you, you gave that, that experiment of the rat lifting its tail and non-use of its legs actually like kind of, so my question was also kind of about the relationship of exercise and what kind of exercises that you recommend and how that might relate to actually exacerbating the disease. I think that, that this, this animal, an animal model, you know, is something, you can't go directly to humans from this animal model. This is a model where you, Overexpressed TNF. These patients are these these rat these mice these mice are all very sick with it with the disease, active inflammation everywhere, and you just do one little thing to perturb it by unloading the hind feet, you had less bone formation. All right, that was that was all the experiment was to show. The animal models give you a, a clue, a hint, a, a possibility of something that could happen in the human being. Okay, but it does not mean that you that there's some specific exercise that you should do or not do. Okay, now the real doctor in me is saying, look, uh, just avoid unnecessary trauma. You know, that's the, I mean, that's the worst thing you could do, is is to ride a motorcycle, okay, or do something or snow skiing where you are exposed to major trauma. All right. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that makes the most sense to me, you know, to do. But in terms of physical working out and stuff like that, you know, I, don't, I, I can't make it a therapeutic recommendation for you to do that. If it were me, I would do mostly muscle strengthening and conditioning and not impact loading. You know, and you can do a lot of that, you know, on stationary bicycles and, you know, and things like that. And you can sort of reduce the impact loading, the pounding, and get the same amount of physical activity in other ways. Now, guys, I got to go to another thing, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you.